Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Alrighty, folks, it is Shay here, and welcome back to another episode. Today, we are visiting with Brian Reisinger, and he is the author of Land Rich Cash Poor, which those of you in agriculture very clearly know the meaning of that phrase. But I have not read the book yet, I will say that, but I have had a few conversations with Brian. And what Brian and I are going to be talking about today are kind of why he wrote the book and what he covers in the book. And a lot of what he talks about is how from the early 1900s up through today and through COVID, rural America has changed, farms and ranches have changed. And he talks about what factors, whether it's the economy, the population, technology, policy, transition plans, how those changes over the years have impacted how farmers and ranchers operate, how many farmers and ranchers there are today, how what challenges rural communities face. And so it's kind of a it's a different interview than I've done before. It's a new topic, but I think it's really insightful and informational to really just wrap your head around how some of these changes, even though maybe some of them we don't think of as directly impacting farms and ranches truly are. And so that's what we're going to dive into today. Now, I do want to remind you that if you are interested in podcasting, I 100% want to support you. Podcasting is something that has truly changed my life in so many ways and has been so beneficial. But I know, whether it's from my other podcast clients or from other people I talk to, that one of their biggest concerns is if they have time for it. Now, if you are one of these people who has been wondering about podcasting, kind of throwing the idea around, but is really held back on that time constraint, will you have time for it? Go to my website that links in the show notes, but go to my website and use the contact feature. And you, if you fill out that form and just say you have questions about podcasting and how much time it takes, I'll send you a free guide that kind of breaks down the process of podcasting and a little bit about how much time each segment takes from the beginning, kind of to where you get a little bit more experienced. So happy to share that free resource with you. Now with that, let's visit with Brian. All right, Brian. Well, I am excited to have you on the podcast today and talk a little bit about who you are, but more importantly, kind of about the topics you're passionate about and how they even led to you writing a book that we'll be releasing soon. So before we dive into that, I want you to tell me just a little bit about your background um, in agriculture and how you fit into agriculture today. Um, well, thank you for having me. I'm a big fan of the podcast and looking forward to the conversation. Um, where I fit into all of this is I grew up on a fourth generation dairy farm in Southern Wisconsin. We go back to the early 1900s and I grew up working with my dad from the time I could walk and I loved our way of life. I was passionate about my roots, but what I learned over time was that I had more talent for words, or at least I hope talent for words than I did have talent for crops and cattle like my dad. And so I wrestled with that growing up. And I ended up going into journalism and public policy world before getting into writing my book, Land Rich, Cash Poor. And this has really been a big journey for me um, coming back to our way of life and, and marrying up my career with my roots. And I talked with my family and a lot of people from over the course of multiple generations for this book. And it's really been an opportunity for me to bring those things together. And I still help out on the business side of our farm. And I pitch in and hop in a tractor when I'm able to. Um, but my dad and mom own the farm and my sister is actually, we're going to take it over. And so it's truly a family operation that we all have a part in. And, you know, it's just an honor for me to be able to try to tell that story and talk about this vanishing way of life and how it affects people. Yes. And you have that unique connection that agriculture needs to kind of bridge that gap between people on the other side that we sometimes don't connect with. Now, within that, when we were talking previously, you are very passionate about how rural America is changing and how farms and ranches are evolving and have evolved even since you were a little kid helping your father on the farm. Can you talk a little bit about why you are passionate about how rural America is changing? 
Well, I found myself walking that rural urban divide growing up where I did, being passionate about what I'm passionate about, and then working in the lines of work that I did. And I found that there is a divide and people don't realize. And I think it's really important for rural and urban to understand this. Rural people live this. People who grew up on farms and ranches live the fact that we have so many of our farms and ranches disappearing, many of them surviving, becoming different and, and learning to evolve to survive. And so there's good and there's bad, there's challenges and there's triumphs in that. Um, people who live in rural areas grow up with that, they experience it. They may not always get an opportunity to know all of those outside forces that are driving it because you're just living it. And so I think it's really important to unveil this issue for people who are living it to be able to say, hey, here's what's happening. I'm, and I'm glad that there's a voice out there talking about this. That's what I hope to do from the rural perspective. From the urban perspective, I'm saying to people, this is your food supply. You know, people don't really stop and think as often as we wish they would. No farms, no food, no ranches, no food, right? And it is a reality that the things that are happening in rural America affect every single American dinner table. And I think it's so important for urban America to understand that partially because we want everybody in this country to be able to eat. That's what, you know, those of us who grow up on farms and ranches are passionate about, at least in part, and partially because if we're going to solve the issues and make it so that more farms and more ranches can continue to evolve and survive and um, fewer of them fall by the wayside in ways that we didn't wish, we have to be able to address these issues as a country. And so rural and urban America both have to agree that this is important if we're going to do something about it. So what are some of these changes that you're passionate about and talk about in your book? Yeah, absolutely. So we talk about it as sort of an untold history of the disappearing American farmer. And I emphasize for people, that doesn't mean that this is all bad. It doesn't mean that it's all terrible. Um, there's a lot of incredible resilience, a lot of incredible innovation, um, amazing things that have happened. It's also true that we lost millions of farms since the early 1900s. We actually averaged 45,000 farms per year that we lost. And so a lot of things have driven that. Over the years, over the eras, I look at each era of history um, from the early 1900s to the 2000s, and I look for the story beneath the surface. What was causing it that maybe people don't realize? And then I tie that with my family story. And over the years, there was everything from economic upheaval, the, the Great Depression, later on the farm crisis, the 1980s. There were um, issues and changes of globalization. There was what happened during COVID. There was the Great Recession. Some of these things happened the entire economy, and they simply had a unique impact on farms. Some of these things, like the farm crisis, was farmers' very own economic crisis of their own, you know, as if we needed that special distinction on top of everything else that happened. So there's all this economic upheaval where farmers were driven under the ground, um, driven in a foreclosure, driven in a bankruptcy when it didn't need to happen. And we can't guarantee the survival of our farm, all farms, nor should we, but there are a lot of economic upheaval that just didn't need to occur or didn't need to hit farms as hard as they did. There are also changes in population. Um, the American economy shifting from rural to urban that had a big change, um, drew workforce off the farms, changed where some of our economic activity was going on. There was technological innovation, which did incredible things. It made it so that farms could handle more acres and more animals with fewer people breaking their backs to do it. But it also meant that at times farms were replaced. And there's actually a really important point about technology that I won't dwell on, but we can dive into if you like, which is how in the 1970s and 80s, we actually shifted from technological innovation, benefiting all farms of all sizes and being what they call scale neutral to really starting to benefit farms at the largest end of the spectrum. And this is nothing against those bigger farms. I grew up with, as I'm sure you and a lot of your listeners did, a lot of farms that uh, stayed a certain size, some that didn't make it, some that survived by getting bigger. And we don't begrudge those folks. We're glad that they survived, you know, and we're glad that they innovated. But we do see a point where technology began to benefit um, farms and not necessarily bring along those medium and small size farms that could maybe be as efficient and could still fill a market need if only that technology was affordable for them too. And so there was all these things as well as government policy and it all mixed together to create a series of perfect storms that in my mind, wiped out more farms than we needed to, even though it was always going to be some amount of consolidation, we could have more farms fulfilling more purposes and having a more resilient food supply uh, today if we had done that. In your book, do you talk at all about transition planning and having like a business that is attractive for the next generation? Because I wonder, like, there, like you said, there are so many factors that have played into why there are less farms today and we could you can't blame it on any one thing and from my perspective I do think part of it might be that 
especially my generation doesn't like I wouldn't want to go back to an operation that wasn't going to be a viable business. And that's that's a big deal. Absolutely. That's such a great question. And and I love this is why I love talking to people who grew up in agriculture because you see those things and we wrestle with that in our family. And I do talk about it in the book. Some of them are big historic moments, like in the 1940s, when we had so many people shifting from rural areas to urban areas post-World War II, the economy was industrializing, and people were saying, hey, I can go make more money on the factory floor than I can work for dad here at home. And by the way, there's 10 brothers and sisters anyway, you know? And so it made a lot of sense for that shifting to occur. Generation after generation, that still happens. And the reality is that some of the time farms from the prior generation, they work for that generation. But when it comes time to pass the baton, it's not a business model that's viable for the future. Or maybe it could be viable for a little bit, but boy, it's not going to be able to help you make the farm payments when you're buying land from mom and dad under land contract or what have you. Mm -hmm. So we see that all the time. And succession challenges really are one of the big problems um, that lead to farms disappearing. And you know, our family has wrestled with that. I talk about that in the book. We milked dairy cows for three generations from the early 1900s through the early 2000s. And during COVID, my dad and our family, we decided to sell our herd and shift to a diversified farm operation where we raise heifers, custom heifers for other dairy farms, where we raise beef cattle, and where we raise a wide range of cash crops. And so we've really returned to a mixed agriculture that's kind of the mixed agriculture of our roots, actually, the way it was in the early 1900s before dairy really overtook Wisconsin, which was a good thing. But dairy got to the point where you had to be a certain size and scale for it to work. And so our farm faced the choice. Hey, you can you can grow by many multiples in terms of the size of your herd, take out debt to do that, or you can shift toward another model. We don't begrudge people to make different decisions than us. There's a lot of great dairies that grew to a couple hundred or a couple thousand, and we're rooting for those families. For us, it made sense to make a change and diversify our farming operation and try to sell different types of crops and products to different markets. So that's what we're doing. But we're working through that while my dad and mom get older and while my sister comes into a position of being able to take over. And those are scary transitions. And we absolutely understand why so many families, the next generation looks at it and says, I don't think I can make a living at that. And, and I got to be able to do that, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I want to go into a few of these factors a little more. I think you talked quite a bit about, because you talked about economy, population, technology, and policy were kind of the main ones that you brought up. Was there any other bucket that I kind of missed? Those are the big buckets. Yeah, there's so yeah. many but those are kind of the big categories I came across at, over and over throughout the history of our family farms. Yeah. So you spoke quite a bit about economy when you first brought it up, but would you talk a little bit more about that population when there was a shift from more people moving to urban areas? Yeah. So it began in a way that made total sense. There were so many, I mean, my grandpa had 14 brothers and sisters total counting him in the Great Depression. So there's so many kids and there weren't 14 farms for all those kids to take over, right? So there was a whole large workforce in rural areas. And meantime, post-World War II, coming out of the depression, we got this big industrialized economy. It made sense for a lot of people to move from rural areas to urban areas, to take those jobs in factories and other places. And, and you know, this was people climbing into the middle class. It also was a time when those who took over the farm, like my grandpa did for my great grandpa, those folks climbed in the middle class. So we were, this was happening, this shift of rural workforce to urban workforce was happening at a time when people in both the urban economy and the rural economy were kind of climbing in the middle class. It was like an incredible time in our country's history. The issue is that that rural to urban shift of population largely continued. And it was like young people that it went to such a degree that you had communities that started having more people dying than being born. And you stopped having people to volunteer for the fire department or to start small businesses or to go and serve on the school board or to have kids to do those things for the next generation. And you had a lot of rural communities really languish. Some of them even disappear. And that has continued for the most part. There's times in our history where it kind of doubles back a little bit or swings the other way, but for the most part, that's continued um, for nearly a century. And now today, post COVID, you can actually see, we have an opportunity to reverse that. And it shows, that opportunity shows the, the cost of this. And what I mean by that is post COVID, more people began living outside the city. They said, I can do my job remotely from the city. I'm going to come into these rural areas. And more 
people who remain in rural areas were able to access more jobs that could be done remotely, right? So you got more people, therefore more ideas, therefore more money coming to rural areas. And we have a chance to revitalize our rural regional economies. In the absence of that, decade after decade, losing all these workforce, losing all these people to take over farms, to start businesses, to become customers and suppliers of farms, you saw the rural economy really languish. It just went too far. And so it breaks your heart because you kind of think, when was that moment? When did we need just to have the, the trickle of farm kids leaving for the city to slow down? And how could we have picked that perfect moment? It's kind of one of those heartbreaking things in this. History. And I live that, you know, having lived on the farm and off the farm and going back and forth and having a career and still trying to remain involved with the farm and, and seeing the value of that as I went through my career changes, I wrestle with that one um, mightily because we do need to pursue opportunity. You do want kids on the farm to be able to go have opportunity, whether it's in the rural or the urban economy. We also don't want our rural economies to just languish, you know? That's something that when I was moving back after college, um, my husband and I weren't engaged yet, but that's something we talked about a lot because it's like, if I hadn't had my own business or the ability to work remote, would there have been a job opportunity in the rural community that yeah. would have best utilized my talents and skills? And that's a, that's a big thing. Absolutely. I would say kind of another point that popped in my head when you were talking about that is I just remember being in, I mean, elementary all the way through high school because it was one school building, right? But looking at class pictures of my great grandma, my grandpa and his sisters, my dad and uncle, and then my sister and I's and seeing how those, the amount of people in those classes was shrinking. Yes. And at that point, that was the generations before me, it was one school for the town. By the time I graduated, it was one school for the whole county. Mm -hmm. We are seeing the same thing. My high school, when I was in high school, we had about 100 kids. It was a big class. I was a big class at that time. The classes are getting smaller. And there have been all these elementary schools that used to feed into the middle school and the high school. Five, six schools closed down to now like two, three, mm -hmm. you know, and you do see these communities. And it's because people are leaving. It's not because nobody wants those kids to have a school in their town. You know, it's driven by that population loss. And when you lose people, you lose all those things. You lose economic opportunity, you lose um, educational opportunity, you lose tax base. And, and these communities they can't help it. They just slide into kind of this dilapidated state. Well, and it's hard for other businesses to start if they aren't going to have the support within the community as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that was population dive a little bit more into technology yeah the technology one is pesky because it's it's frustrating and it also is kind of understandable so here's what happened and i spoke with a economist named jim mcdonald who has investigated this more than anybody but i also talked with a lot of people from different vantage points to kind of match up what he was saying and i think that it's largely borne out to be true what happened is in the and it's actually connected to this population issue. You had so many people going to urban factories because rural farms couldn't give them the wages they needed. So we needed to have a way for farm wages to catch up with factory wages. So the way that that was done was with technology that made it so that farms could take on more acres, more animals, fewer people breaking their back to do it. Like you got to be able to do all this work with not as many people, right? It was solving that workforce issue. And it was allowing farms to become a little bigger and a little more profitable. And again, a lot of that is justified because there's competition and there's going to be consolidation. And it makes sense that some farms are going to say, hey, I can do a little better. I'm going to go over here and buy my neighbor and I'm going to get a little bigger. And, and boy, you know, I can support my family and maybe I need to support two generations with wages and health insurance and that kind of stuff too, you know? So that was going on. And then eventually farm wages kind of caught up with factory wages and it leveled out a little bit. And that's not to say that nobody on a farm couldn't go find a better job in a factory or vice versa, but it kind of leveled out, it caught up. And in the 70s and 80s, what that meant is we didn't have to have technology driving us toward bigger acreage and toward more animals endlessly. That could still be part of the solution. It could still be a good thing. But also, we could have shifted so that our technology could have been producing innovation for the large farms, the medium-sized farms, the small farms, provide technology that's what they call scale neutral, um, which for people who haven't looked at that real closely, all that really means is it's a, it's a technology that a small farm as well as a medium farm uh, could buy like a large farm and it is not only affordable 
meaning you can buy it and you can make back your investment and pay for itself, but also it's practical. You can implement it. And we stopped having technology like that increasingly for the small and medium-sized farms. And in the 70s and 80s, it became really crucial because those wages had caught up. We didn't have to keep on making farms get bigger. There were still going to be some farms getting bigger and that's okay, but we didn't have to force it so much with the technology the way we did. And by the way, that stuff happened right before the farm crisis, right? So medium and small size farms that have a slightly less bright future because there isn't quite as much technology as they can use to evolve into the future and to innovate, went into that environment with the farm crisis, less armed than ever. And then they came out of that farm crisis with that technology issue still there. So once the farm crisis foreclosures ended and things stabilized and farm families and rural communities were back on their feet, they look back, you know, that decade was lost and they still don't have the technology that they need if they're a small or medium operation. And I said it a few times, but I'll say it again. I really think it's important to say this is not a large versus small farm thing. This is just saying that technology could have provided innovation for farm businesses and operations of all sizes and types in different markets. And we could have had, you know, more of our farms make it even as some of them were getting bigger. And so that's a really tricky one because it's so hard and um, it's something that we could have done. You know, if we'd known and we'd had research and development focused around trying to make sure that we had technology for farms of all sizes, maybe there are more small farms that have more types of markets they could fulfill, you know? I, yes, there's, we could do a whole episode on that if we wanted to. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I mean, I appreciate like what you said about how it doesn't, there's not, there's no good or bad on any scale. And I do believe that no matter what size you are, if you are truthful about what, how that size can survive as a business and get creative and a little scrappy and build collaborations and relationships with others, you can make it work, but it's not going to look the same as a larger farmer, or it's not going to look the same as someone who's maybe more, I don't really like the word hobby farmer or boutique farmer, but someone who's a lot more niche down and small but each size has their own advantages and disadvantages and their own unique avenues to be successful. And that's kind of the meaning of the title of the book, Land Rich, Cash Poor. People who grew up on farms have a sense of that meaning probably, but but for people who don't and, and for urban audiences, it really just means you have this land that's so valuable, but increasingly you can't make money on it. You can't make a living. So you're stuck either saying, well, I'm going to sell that land and not only my job, but it's my community, it's my home, it's my heritage many times going back generations and, or you can hold on to it and increasingly find it harder to grind out a living. And a lot of that happened because of all these factors, but technological innovation was one of them that made it harder for the small and medium sized farms when we could have had an economy that more readily embraced all types. Mm -hmm. So the other bucket that we didn't talk much about was policy. And I don't talk much about policy on my show in general, as you know, as a listener, but go into a few things that you found as you were researching and writing your book. Well, I don't blame you because it can tick people off um, and it's a complicated situation. But what I found as I was looking at the history of this is that time and time and time again, our government policy was focused around kind of one specific thing. That's a worthy goal, but shouldn't have been the whole thing. And that was cheap food. That's it. And cheap food is really important. People in an urban rural economy alike need food that's affordable and and that is a worthy goal. But the issue was that they were almost always geared around that. And there was a little bit less thought to what's going to help farms of any size continue to be able to make it, not guarantee them income, not guarantee them that they'll make it. You got to still run a smart business, right? You got to run a smart operation to make it. And I think everybody, every farmer believes that. But how do you craft policy in a way that doesn't favor some over others and doesn't tilt the table? So in the depression, there was all kinds of government programs that was in an intervention that a lot of people would say, hey, without that intervention, we'd have lost more farms. Some of those same people, if you talk to some of those historians, they'll say that's true. And they'll also say that some of those programs and policies favored farms in certain sectors, farms of certain sizes, because it's what the government said, well, this is what we need right now to have affordable food in the depression. Again, a worthy goal, but it's kind of the whole kit and caboodle. It's it's what it's all about. And 
The issue with it is, is just simply that it's short-sighted, not that it's exactly wrong. We want affordable food, but if you're only focused on that, you're going to have policies that emphasize that, and you're not going to have policies that help make sure farms of all sizes can make it. You're not going to have policies to make sure that farms grow in various types of food and a really diversified farm industry can make it. And so what you're going to end up with is what we have now, which is a system that does not have as many options for how people buy and sell food. And it's not to say the options that are there are bad, but we saw in COVID, and we can get more into that if you like, but we saw in COVID how limited options, the dilemmas that it placed farmers and consumers alike in. And that's because decade after decade. So the depression was one era. Another era was in the 1950s. There was a time period where America really paid attention to how do we make sure that our um, industries aren't sliding toward monopoly. And that began to slide a little bit because we just had like great big industry, like huge fast food chains growing and creating all of this need for food sold to these really large companies that serve people all across the country, right? And that continued and we kind of lost, the government lost its focus on making sure that industries didn't get dominated by too, too few, like a very few number of large players, basically. And the reason that matters is because it becomes harder to have regional economies. Now, if the major fast food chains had grown up in this economy and said, hey, we're going to serve every corner of the country and we're going to buy from every corner of the country, that would be different. You could have farms supplying your local fast food restaurants in all these parts of the country. It could have actually been a renaissance for rural regional economies. It didn't have to be not. But what happened is we just had bigger and bigger companies trying to keep up with those fast food chains and then bigger and bigger intermediary agribusiness companies. And then, by the way, bigger and bigger farms. And this isn't to blame just fast food. It happened all across the American economy. And so those are some changes that happened as well. Um, the other thing that happened is a lot of the policies from the Great Depression carried over and were kind of piled upon. And I'm not here to say that any one particular program was good or bad. We could get into that. But what happened is they just kind of kept getting piled upon and never really got reformed for what made sense. And so you just started to have a really big amount of policy that didn't always make sense. Sometimes one policy was bumping into another one and kind of left farmers or consumers in a untenable position. And it just slid rather than us having a policy that said, hey, how can we maintain a strong, robust, diverse farm sector that's going to allow farms of all sizes fulfill food needs of all kinds for a longer period of time, rather than just saying, how can we get it the cheapest only? And I think we could still have a affordable food supply with farms of all sizes supplying food needs of all kinds if we had done it a little bit differently. So we didn't have to not have affordable food, but only focusing on that ended up being a little short-sighted and kind of put blinders on for us. Yeah, there's, again, another thing we could talk about for much longer if we really yes. wanted to get into it. But I appreciate how you it kind of made that concise and talked about kind of some of the overarching challenges and things that came with that. Now, when people... Like, what is the main benefit from people? I know you touched on it, but what is the main benefit from people reading your book and gaining more insight into these challenges, even if it isn't your book, but other resources as well? And just having this understanding of how thing, how and why things have shifted over the last century. The most important reason for people to do it is to understand that, you know, farms are food and we need to have a sustainable approach for our country. And COVID showed that. And, and whatever people think about COVID and the way that our country dealt with it, one thing that we know that happened is that the spread of the virus and then also the response to shutting things down to try to contain that virus, again, whether people agree or disagree with each individual decision, the spread of that virus and the reaction to it, it really shut down a lot of large parts of our food economy. And you had people in the grocery store saying, hey, why can't I find this food that I, it's it's not on the shelf? Or if they were finding it, it was more expensive. And then you had farmers, a lot of farmers struggling with where to sell their goods. We had farmers dumping milk. We had cattle getting slaughtered because they couldn't get to market. We had produce spoiling, all this stuff happening. So how do you have farmers desperately wanting to get their products to consumers and consumers desperately want to have those products, but that not happening? The way that happens is that we have a vulnerable supply chain. And so we just have, relatively speaking, relative to earlier times in our history, we have fewer distribution channels and fewer places that food comes from. A lot of it goes through um, a few processing plants or a few 
rail lines or a few trucking routes and a few processors and a few buyers and suppliers, as opposed to like a lot of different places. And if we had more businesses of all sizes from farm gate to American dinner table, there would be more routes and more ways for people to have food, more choices, that kind of thing. So not having a situation where we have farms of all sizes being able to be robust, having this scenario where we have farms disappearing for a century to the tune of 45,000 farms per year, that's happening with all kinds of other changes in our economy that are leading to more limited places for people to get their food from. And so when you have a disaster like COVID, or let's say there's a big outbreak of swine flu or a big, big outbreak of bird flu or whatever the case may be, you have a supply chain that doesn't have as many routes to get food to people. That's the first thing that happens. The other thing that happens is food prices go through the roof. So that's not the fault of farmers or agribusinesses or anybody who they're operating as efficiently as they can. When you have that scarcity, those food prices go through the roof. And we saw in the wake of COVID, we saw food prices rising far faster than the rate of inflation. And the rate of inflation was making everything more expensive for everybody. The cost of living was going up. The cost of groceries was going up faster than other costs in a way that shows that there was more problems with our food economy than other parts of our economy. And so if we want to have a food economy where there's more choices available for people all the time, and we have more resiliency when there's a disaster, and where we don't have food prices skyrocketing in a kind of a disastrous way when there are problems, we need to be able to have more farms, more businesses, more supply chains, more links all the way from the farm gate to the dinner table so that we have more routes and more ways to get things to people. Because otherwise, we just have fewer and fewer farms and companies carrying an increasingly perilous burden, you know, and it's something that's not fair to anybody, the consumer, the farmer, or any of the businesses in between, because nobody wanted to live through that in COVID, you know? Mm -hmm. When you were doing research, did you just look at how the United States has changed or did you look at other countries and some of their models as well? That's a great question. I mainly looked at America because I was interested in why did we have this phenomenon of the disappearing American farmer? that I had seen in our economy and our history and that, that our family and so many other families had lived. But I did have an opportunity to do some comparisons. And there are some interesting ones. Um, the first big overarching one that I saw is that America has for decades been a global leader in innovation and has actually been lagging. And you hear talk, people talk about this outside of the food economy. You hear people talk about it in, uh, be it national defense or computer programming and all kinds of technologies. In our country just is not investing in research and development like we used to. And that's um, that's private sector, that's private university money, and that's also public money, it's government money. So all three of these buckets are really important. And America just is not investing in innovation like it used to. And so we're falling behind other countries that are innovating more quickly. We're still more innovative than a lot of the globe because we did so well at it for so long. So I don't want anyone to think that we're like, you know, done for, but we are falling behind and we are a lag on innovation right now. And so the good news is that's something we can turn around because we're still pretty innovative, but we got to do something about it because we're falling behind. There's also some other models in other parts of the country that were interesting to look at, like for instance, dairy. Um, in dairy in Canada, dairy farmers have, uh, I guess I'll call it kind of a closed system where they limit imports coming in and the government is able to sort of guarantee them, roughly speaking, a price that's a little higher than what you might get in the world markets. And um, it's called supply control, where you know, you're know you limiting the amount of supply and you're kind of able to keep prices at a certain level. And there's people, that is a big dilemma, at least in dairy and I'm sure other sectors deal with it. I can just say, we grew up debating it all the time. It's a big dilemma. It's like, man, you know, is, is, is a supply management system a way to go where the farms that are here can get you know, a, little, a little bit better price than they would otherwise get? And it's like, well, on the other hand, it's very restrictive in terms of what you can do and being able to get the opportunity to expand your herd or what have you, a lot of choices are removed from the market in a system like that too. So there's these big trade-offs and agriculture economics is a very tricky thing. And farmers know that because they're living it, but trying to figure out how to deal with these big forces and make it so that more of our farms can make it without making it so that the farms that do make it aren't really even running their own farm that's a really challenging thing to try to figure out. And that's why this is so hard. And that's why sometimes our country hasn't always made the right choice. You're never going to make everyone happy. That's right. 
the the big realization that I came across is realizing what farm families go through. And that might sound funny because I grew up in a farm family. So you think I should know that. But one of the things I say in the book is that this is a history that will shock people who didn't live it and, and even surprise people who did. And I was just amazed at the number of times that what was going on in the world and in the economy that was hitting farms in a unique way lined up with challenges that my family faced. So in the early 1900s, my great grandfather and great grandmother, they escaped what was going to be World War I Europe, war torn Europe, and came to America and they wanted a better life. And there were, I mean, it was such an era of hard work and incredible danger. There were terrible farm accidents. I had a great uncle. Uh, who lost his leg at the age of two in the fields, trampled by his own father's horses, things like that. Um, fast forward up through the Depression, my grandpa, their eldest son, grew up through the Great Depression and the the hardship that they faced, the, the accidents, the, the way that one medical bill could put them under, the farms around them that were foreclosing just up the hill. Our family ended up moving um, to a farm where my great grandpa continued on the original homestead and my grandpa moved to a farm up the hill. The reason he was able to do that is because the family up there that they knew had lost their farm. And so they were able to buy that farm out of foreclosure. And it was big opportunity for our family, but it was also a tragic thing for another family. So my grandpa, before he got married, said he wanted to pay off the farm. So he got married at the age of like late thirties, I think 37, because he said, I want to pay off the farm before I try to raise a family here. Um, my grandpa um, dealt with all kinds of things, having grown up in that kind of hardship. Um, and then when he was a grown man, he fell off a corn crib and fell 30 feet through the air and broke his back. My dad at the age of tender age of eight stepped up, started milking cows. My dad's 72. And sometimes it breaks my heart to think that he started work at eight. He started the work of a man at the age of eight and it was never the same. Now he loves that work and it's a beautiful way of life and he wouldn't trade it. But that's also a hard thing to have an eight-year-old boy have to do. Um, I was born during the middle of the farm crisis when my mom and dad, my dad was trapping rabbits and squirrel and my mom was closing off empty rooms to the house so they could save on heat because they were trying to figure out a way to put food on the table and, and save money to be able to make it through, you know? Um, and then, you know, modern day, it's easy to forget, but farm families today are living through incredible things. The things that farm families had to do during COVID at times when milk was getting dumped and meat was getting, animals were getting slaughtered and produce was lost, you know, all of those things. And, um, you know, farm families over the generations, if you don't stop and look at it and really realize what they survive, you won't realize the level of hardship, but also the level of beauty. Why do people do it? Because it's such an incredible way of life. And so I went through all that and I I saw the resilience that you see in the farm families. And it really gave me hope, even though it was some really harrowing stuff and uh, maybe makes for a good story, but it also wasn't always easy to write about. It wasn't easy to talk about. And at the end of the day, to have families go through what our family went through, and there are so many families like that all across the country, it shows the resilience of farm families. And it shows that if we can figure out a way to solve this issue, boy, you could power the whole country on the resilience of a farm family if you could figure out to get this stuff right and figure out ways to help farms make it easier for them to keep going. Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing that realization and those personal stories. I think uh, those of us who have tuned into our own family histories can find ways to relate to that as well and how incredible farmers and ranchers are through all generations. Yeah, it's amazing. I hope so. Well, Brian, I really appreciate you taking the time to visit with me today. Before we wrap up, what would you like to tell listeners about your book, where they can find it, um, the pre-order, the true release date, all that stuff? Absolutely. I appreciate it. So right now, People can find the book on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, IndieBound, all of the places you can pre-order books online. It's called Land Rich, Cash Poor, and you can find it there, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, IndieBound, anywhere you can buy a book online, really. And the launch of the book, meaning when we're going to start selling it in bookstores and doing events, is going to be on August 20th. Uh, I'm launching in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, back in my home state of Wisconsin, and we're going to be doing a nationwide tour where we're going to be talking about this in communities all over the country, going to a lot of states that have a, a proud agriculture history and a major agricultural economy, um, but have had a lot of that slip away and, and have a lot going on and a lot of people who might be interested in this. And um, so people can find it online now, or they can continue to find it online in the future, and they can find it in bookstores starting August 20th. Awesome. Well, Brian, thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate the time. Alrighty, folks, that's a wrap on that one. Now, if you are interested in Brian's book, like I said, I know I'm excited to buy it and read it in its entirety. 
you can go to the link in my show notes and there's a link there that will connect you with um, Brian, all of his socials, his website, and just give you a place to access that book. With that, have a great day and happy ranching.